Hello. While searching around on eBay, I came across a listing for an untested A590 drive for the Amiga. I always wanted one of these for my Amiga 500 Plus when I was younger, so I decided to take a bid on it. And here it is. Cost me 90 quid, but no power supply included. So in this video, we're going to explore what the A590 is, take a look inside this one, and if it's not working, we'll attempt to fix it. First, a little bit of history. I found this advert from Commodore, which describes the A590 as coming with a 20MB XT hard disk. The XTIDE interface is the 8-bit version of the modern 88 IDE interface. The A590 plugs into the expansion port on the left of the Amiga. The hard disk comes pre-installed with Workbench, and will auto-boot into it. You also have the option of replacing the XT hard disk with a SCSI one, and there's also a SCSI connection on the back of the drive allowing you to connect more devices. It also includes space for up to 2 megabytes of fast RAM. Finally, the case includes a fan to keep everything running cool. Now the first thing I noticed about this one is its serial number. Looking around the internet, they're usually in the tens of thousands, but this one has a very small number of 523. So this must have been one of the very first units sold, and would have probably cost around £450, and that wouldn't have come with any RAM. Now the full 2 megabytes you could add would have cost another £300. In today's money, that would have been around £1,800. Now I'm sure the price would have dropped as time went on, but someone must have been very eager to purchase this one, so let's have a look inside. As I've said before, the case screws are missing along with the hard drive mounting posts, which means I can just lift the lid off. Inside, we find a Fujitsu SCSI hard drive that's 4.35 gigabytes in size, along with its power cable, but no SCSI cable. Now the first surprise, all of the A590s I've seen on the internet had two holes here for the power and disk activity LEDs to poke through, but this doesn't. We can see that someone has added a red LED to the drive for disk activity. This makes me wonder what other mods have been done. There's also a possibility that the lid doesn't belong to the bottom half. Some of the earlier units actually had a red power LED and green activity indicators. Some models of these drives, and I'm assuming this one too, had front LEDs connected via the connector here, but I'm not exactly sure how they fitted into the lid. Now let's take a closer look at the PCB. Straight away we see the classic party mix that fits with all the fun names that Commodore engineers like to give their boards. And if I lift this sticker you'd probably see their names as well. Again at this point this board isn't what I expected. Firstly, this has Rev 6 printed here. Most of the ones I've seen on the internet say Rev 7. Also, it has XT and SCSI connections populated, but also note the power supply connector here. If I compare this with other photos of the A590 PCB, you'll see this section looks quite a bit different. That seems to show two XT connectors, along with a smaller power connector. Now back to my board, this capacitor here looks like it's been replaced too. So, let's take a look at what's on the PCB and work our way across the board. This is where the power and disk activity LED should be, named Fred and Wilma. This pin header here is another way these can be connected. These are the ROM chips, and from what I can understand these were probably the first publicly issued ROMs, maybe version 4.6, but we'll see if we can identify those later. If we want to support larger hard disks, assuming we can get this working, then we'll probably need to upgrade these. This is the main DMAC, or Direct Memory Address Controller, and you'll see it's version 1. There also appears to be a small amount of damage here. This chip, labelled 390333-03, from what I understand is specifically programmed to handle the glue logic for the RAM. And this one here is for the SCSI logic. This chip here is the WD33C93PL. It's a SCSI controller chip made by Western Digital, and you'll notice it's revision 2. There are quite a few revisions of this chip, 4 being the most common all the way up to revision 8, but 2 is quite uncommon. From what I understand, the earlier versions were very buggy, so we may want to swap that out later too. Now can you see this set of jumpers here marked 2M, 1M, 512K and Amnesia? This is how you tell the board how much of the RAM has been populated. And this board looks quite fully populated with a full 2 megabytes of RAM, although at this point we don't know if any of it will work. Now turning it over, let's have a look at the other side. Hmm, it appears to have had some modding done to it, and I already don't like the look of this. Now these two wires are actually a mod that allows you to use this without an external power supply, and they look a bit dodgy. I doubt if running that big scuzzy hard disk from this was a great idea. Also, if you take a look at this white wire, you can see it's actually been pierced and stabbed by the connector for the DMAC in two places. Goodness knows what damage that'll have caused. This particular wire does appear on some of the other boards, but strangely not all. It originally must have been factory fitted, although I think this has been replaced. 
If we take a look at the schematic for the A590, which is in the service manual, you can actually see that this wire connects the memory select jumper pins to pin 11 on U5. That's the glue logic RAM chip I mentioned earlier, so I guess that kind of makes sense. What I don't know is if this mod was added because someone thought it was missing or it actually does need it. So I'm going to replace those dodgy looking wires and while I'm at it, I'm going to remove that red LED too. Also, given one of the electrolytic capacitors has been replaced, I'll replace them all so they all look the same. that I've reworked the wiring on the back again, a little tidier than before. I've also swapped the red and yellow wires around to be more consistent with the actual wiring on those connectors. I tested the capacitors as I removed them and they all seemed to actually be in good health, so probably didn't need replacing. So doing those changes, I'm ready to plug it into the Amiga. But before I do that, I'd like to do something about the power and drive LEDs. So, I mentioned before that the LEDs can be connected via this connector on the main board, which is what I assume the original board had. So I'll make up a connector to attach the LEDs to the board. I've printed these little black pieces to join the LEDs on the end of the light covers for the case. I don't know how these would have been connected before, so I'm just improvising. With that all ready, I'm going to power it up. I'm not going to connect the hard drive at this point. Before plugging it in, I want to show you these dip switches on the back. And according to the manual, the first enables the boot ROM, which if enabled and you have Kickstart 1.3 onwards will allow the drive to auto boot. Without that, the drive needs to be mounted using software. The second, LUN, has something to do with how many drives are connected at each SCSI address. The third controls the timeout when searching for drives on the SCSI bus. And finally the fourth is currently listed as reserved for future use. Now as I only want to check the RAM, I'm going to leave all the switches off. This effectively disables the hard disk side of the controller unless activated by software. So I'll plug this in and see what happens. Well I should have caught that on camera, not that you'd have seen much, but I had to power it off very quickly. For some reason it was drawing so much power the Amiga's power LED was very dim and no picture output. Don't worry, I found out why and the Amiga isn't damaged. Some of the RAM chips got very hot, these two in fact, which I've removed. Unfortunately this means we now don't have enough RAM to run the full 2 megabytes, so I'll switch it to 1 meg and we'll plug it in and see what happens. Ok well this is interesting, the first line for device 2 OK means the drive side is OK. The second line, device 10, bad, means we have a RAM fault. I'm hoping this is not every chip. By trial and error, I managed to get a working 512k of RAM, and then by swapping the chips one at a time, I ended up with three, including the two that got hot, faulty RAM chips. Interestingly, the board doesn't seem to do any kind of startup check on the RAM chips above the first 512k, and if you leave them unpopulated while setting the board to 2 meg, the board doesn't even notice. Now this was an interesting faulty chip. See, it's actually got a pin missing. I think some eBay seller probably knew about this. To test the RAM properly, I need a RAM testing disk and we have two options. We have the Amiga test kit by Keir Fraser, but also the A590's own test disk, which I found on the Amiga hardware database as a compressed DMS disk. Now, rather than copy them over to the Amiga and decompressing them to disk, I booted WinUAE, loaded Workbench and inserted the DMS disk into the virtual drive. WinUAE will actually use DMS disks natively. Next I'm configuring the Floppy Bridge plugin to use my Drawbridge drive. 
Now back to Workbench, and I'm going to drag the memory setup disk to DF1, which will start the disk copy to a real disk. Yes, I suppose I could have used the DMS command line to do this, but hey, this works. Mind you, I could have also extracted it to an ADF and then written it to the disk manually, but this is way more fun. I've also repeated this process for the A590 setup disk as we'll probably need that later too. With the remaining working RAM chips I should be able to enable 1 megabyte of fast RAM. So I've set the jumper on the A590 to 1 megabyte, powered on and inserted the RAM test disk. Now I've never booted this disk before and I was expecting it would boot to Workbench, but it seems it doesn't and you have to start the test from the CLI. No problem. If you're wondering about the picture quality, this is connected to my Amiga 500 Plus which has the RGB to HDMI adapter installed in it, making captures like this very easy and crisp. So with the program running, it doesn't immediately look like it's doing anything, but if you leave it for a while it starts to run through various test patterns. I think the first two rows relate to the first 512 and the second 512k of RAM. After the RAM test completed, I loaded Workbench just to confirm the RAM, and there we are, just under 1 megabyte of fast RAM showing. So for the rest of the RAM, well, if we take a look at the A590 service manual, it lists several possible compatible RAM chips, and I've ordered a few of each type from eBay to see which one works, and here they are, and all of these appear to work in the A590. Now I've got four of one type, so I'll put them in, and we'll rerun the RAM test making sure to set the jumper for 2 megabytes of RAM. I've speeded this up a little bit, but as you can see it tests ok. I've also decided to test the memory on the Amiga test kit too. You can see the two memory ranges for the RAM. This is an upgraded A500+, Plus, so it does have the full 2 megabytes of chip RAM. The bit we're interested though is the second range, the fast RAM. So running these tests, and yes, I sped this up a little too, but all seems ok. Well, that's the full 2 megabytes of RAM sorted, so at the very least this is a very useful memory expansion. In the next video we'll have a look at the hard drive side of the board, see if it works, and if it doesn't we'll work out and see if we can fix it. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like and subscribing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.